couple of comments here I want to make before we get started with chapter 8 again. Uh, going back to chapter 7, flow over a flat plate. Before I worked a rather long example problem, I had summarized on the right panel of the board the equations to use for laminar flow, turbulent flow, and MEX flow. Well, looking at that, the equations I had for laminar flow were incorrect from my notes. Okay, I just looked at the wrong line on my notes. So this is what you, here's the incorrect ones in your, no, in your notes on from that day. Here's the ones that are correct. So cross these guys out and replace them with these two. Now, when we looked at the example problem, flow over a flat plate. There was five different parts to that problem. So part one was find the local heat flux at x equal one centimeter. We found out that one centimeter, the flow was laminar. So the equation that's in your notes is this one, which is incorrect. It should be this one there. I used the correct one in my numerical calculation, so the answers are all numerically correct. It's just I copied the wrong equation down from my notes to the board. So this is the equation you want to replace in part one of the example problem. Cross him out. This is the one that appears in here on the board that day. Cross that guy out in your notes here and replace it with the correct one right here. Part two was find the heat transfer over the laminar part of the plate. Okay, so it's laminar, but now you want the bar because it's over a certain region. So now this is the correct equation. The one in your notes is probably this one right here, which is incorrect. So cross that guy out in part two on that line and replace it with the correct one, which is right here. But again, the numerical answers are correct because I just copied the incorrect equation from my notes to the board. Okay, so just, just so you get the right equations on your equation sheets for the third midterm, you don't want the wrong equations on your equation sheet. So the correct ones are on the board over there now. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, just a reminder, chapter six, seven homework due today. Uh, the third midterm will cover chapter six, seven, and eight, and we'll talk more about that on Friday and Monday, but the third midterm is a week from today, a week from today, next Wednesday. Okay, so, um, go back now, return to chapter eight. And we're looking at flow in a tube. And so the flow in a tube, picture over here, we have a uniform velocity profile. The velocity is U subscript M, means a mean velocity entering the tube. We have the mean fluid temperature at the inlet, T mean I uniform at the inlet, measuring x along the tube length, the length of the tube, l. The surface of the tube can be one of two conditions. It can either be constant surface heat, uh, constant surface temperature, or constant surface heat flux. One of these two guys. Now, uh, so far, we've found the uh, X fully developed. It takes a while for the fluid to become fully developed in the tube from a uniform profile. That distance is called X fully developed for velocity or X fully developed for temperature. So last time we 
put down equations of how you calculate X fully developed velocity and X fully developed turbulent. We also had equations for how the temperature varied with X for those uh, two conditions, constant tube surface temperature or constant tube heat flux. We, have, we had temperature as a function of X. So that's where we left off last time. So now, today, <laughs> we get to one of the big things in chapter 6, 7, and 8. How do I find the convection coefficient H? Okay. Two cases, one and two. First one, constant wall heat flux. Second one, constant tube surface temperature. If it's constant wall, wall heat flux, oh, it becomes ridiculously easy. This, it's walked through in the textbook in a page and a half. We're going to use the result and not go through all the gory details. No salt is constant, 4.36, just a number. No Reynolds number, no Prandtl number, no, just a constant, 4.36. If the tube surface temperature is constant, the no salt number is just a number, 3.66. No Reynolds number, no Prandtl number, just 3.66. You go back to flow over a flat plate, no salt number, it's not a constant. It depends on X right there, Reynolds number. In this case, for these conditions, constant. Now, it's only valid for certain conditions. So take the first one. Q, S, double prime's a constant. It's only valid for laminar flow. It's only a constant value if it's fully developed velocity and fully developed temperature. And we evaluate the properties at T mean, the mean fluid temperature. Same thing for a constant tube surface temperature. It has to be laminar flow. It has to be fully developed velocity. It has to be fully developed temperature and properties of T mean. We'll talk about what fully developed means in just a minute. But for right now, those are the conditions that have to be satisfied to use those simple equations. So now we get to uh, what happens if, that, if we can't use that particular simple equation. Oh, by the way, before we do that, let's just look at how we find Q. Uh, let's take uh, if Q S double prime is a constant. Okay, then we have uh, Q equal Q S double prime times the area, the surface area of the tube, pi d L, for instance. Okay, so that one is pretty straightforward. If T uh, S equal a constant, then Q double prime H delta T L M. That delta T L M stands for the log mean temperature difference. So here's our problem. put it up here, I think, because I want to save it. Okay.
So we had that on the board last time. We said that's how the temperature varies, the fluid temperature varies if the tube surface temperature is held constant. So tube surface temperature is constant with X, but in this case, the fluid's being heated. So the question becomes then, here's the equation we've used in the past many times. Um, he's a constant. Uh-oh, he's a problem. He's not a constant in that picture, no. So, do you put in Ts minus T mean in here? Or do you put in Ts minus T mean out here? No, neither one. He goes through in the textbook and shows you what you should put in for that. And, uh, what it is, is something called delta T log mean. Delta T log mean equal delta T out minus delta T in divided by natural log delta T out over delta T in. So this is delta T in. And this is delta T out. Okay, so now you have that guy. You could find that guy. Okay. All right, so. Um, Constant wall heat flux, it's pretty, if, if you're given QS double prime, which you normally are, it's pretty easy, of course. That's a, that's a given. If the tube surface temperature is constant, then you use this guy with that guy. Now, you, you can also use Q equal M dot C sub P delta T, T mean out minus T mean in for heating. That works for any case. That works for this case and this case. So, Q equal M dot C sub P delta T, which is T mean out minus T mean in, works for this case and this case. So, really, you've got three equations for Q. Three. Uh, now, What if it's not fully developed? Okay, life becomes much more complex. So, for the entry region in laminar tube flow, This is the equation we have. That's the equation in your textbook 857.
So we're going to talk about when do we know if it's fully developed or not in just a minute. But for right now, that equation is only good if the velocity profiles can be assumed to be fully developed, but the temperature profiles are not fully developed. Go back over here for these two simple equations. They both are fully developed, both velocity and temperature. You can see the similarity. Here's 3.66. Here's 3.66 plus like a correction factor. So that's what it is, 3.66 plus some kind of correction factor of sorts. Okay. Uh, we also have, oh, by the way, before I forget it, this guy right here in the brackets is called the Grotz number. A dimensionless parameter, again, we engineers love dimensionless parameters, so we just call that guy, rather than D over L, Reynolds Prandtl, let's simplify the world. Call it Grotz number. Grotz number. Back up here. Uh, we also have equation 858. for no salt D. If not fully developed velocity, not fully developed temperature. That equation is really long and complex. I'm not going to take the time to put it on the board, it's in the textbook, but it's, it's a long equation. So, when can we assume fully developed or not? Okay. Now, this is a rule we're going to use in our class and for homework or exams. There's a possibility of a different magic number. We're going to use a 10% number. So if x fully developed is less than or equal to 10% of L, assume fully developed velocity. If X fully developed temperature profiles less than or equal to 10% of L, assume fully developed temperature. So, in a problem like that, you calculate X fully developed. We did that last class meeting. Calculate that. Let's give an example. If this was 10, if L was 10 meters, and you get X fully developed velocity of 0.5 meters, what's the magic number? 10% of L, 10% of 10 is one. So if X fully developed velocity is less than one meter, assume it's fully developed. If X fully developed temperature is less than one meter, assume it's fully developed. Okay, so that's how you answer the question. Is the answer yes for velocity, yes for temperature? Here's the two equations. If the answer is uh, here, yes for velocity, no for temperature, here's the equation. If the answer is no for velocity and no for temperature, that's the equation. So that's the choices that you have. Yes, 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 no, 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 okay. So for laminar flow, you've got to answer those questions. You're, 
you're not going to have no yes. You're not going to have no yes. That's for very specific fluids, and the textbook mentions, like liquid metals. We don't deal a lot with liquid metals, liquid potassium, liquid sodium. Some nuclear power plants run on liquid metals, but they're far and few between. So we don't even consider that option. So there's no option over here of no, yes, forget that one. There's only three options for the uh, fully developed. Okay, so that's all the rules then for laminar flow. Now, <laughs> turbulent flow, okay. Uh, I'll put it here. Okay. For a turbulent flow, we've got uh, a couple choices. Well, no, we, well, I'll just put down the one, I think, and we'll live with that one. Let's see if I've got my turbulent flow here somewhere. Turbulent flow. Just so you know, too, all these guys, every equation so far, properties at T mean, the fluid temperature. Properties at the fluid temperature. Obviously, it's the fluid. Um, okay. Nussel D bar. It has the typical form of the Nussalt number and the Reynolds number. Nussalt is a constant times Reynolds number raised to a power times a Prandtl number raised to a power. But in this case, the power on the Prandtl number depends on if the fluid's being heated or cooled. If the fluid's getting hotter as it goes down the tube, N is 0.4. If the fluid gets colder as it goes down the tube, N is 0.3. Equation 861. And of course, the author also puts a qualifier in there. Oh, by the way, all these correlations are within 25%, so don't, don't think they're perfectly exact. They're not within 25%. Okay, so now there, there is another equation. I'm sorry, that's equation 860, not 861. There's another equation, 861, which covers a wider range of properties, Prandtl number especially, but we're not going to get, we're not going that way. We're, we're going to just use this one equation for turbulent flow. Now, Does it, does it, does this equation matter if it's um, constant tube surface temperature or constant surface heat flux? No, it works for both. One equation works for both. You don't need to ask the question, what is it if it's turbulent? You don't ask that question. If it's turbulent, that equation covers both cases. Um, how about fully developed velocity and fully developed temperature? Textbook says reasonably, you just say, it doesn't matter. 
okay? That one equation works for that. I don't care if it's fully developed or not. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care for turbulent. One equation works for fully developed or not. One equation works for constant tube surface temperature or constant tube surface heat flux. Makes life easy. How many choices do you have? None, just one. That's the equation. How about laminar flow? One, two, three, four, four choices to answer. Um, by the way, these tubes are all meant to be smooth. If it's a rough tube, the textbook tells you what to do, but we're looking at smooth tubes. So it's not valid for, quote, rough tubes. Okay, so that takes into account all, any question on this guy then? We're okay. All right, so we're gonna work an example. Um, and we have some whiteboard problems, magic wipies, okay? I don't know what happened, but something happened. <laughs> That's okay. We'll use these guys in paper towels and we'll make, make it work. All right, so I'm going to save that guy. This guy I don't want. You don't need him. And we'll just make room. Let's save him. Okay, save that. Oh, it's okay, I'll get rid of this. Okay, I think we're pretty good. All right. Let's just make sure it's dry before we put the pen on this. Okay, so here's the problem we have. We're going to be heating water in a tube. So let's see our example. Water, fluid comes in, 25 degrees C, mass flow rate, two kilograms per second. Got it. Length, four meters. Oh, let's see here, diameter, four centimeters. Tube surface temperature, 90 degrees. Fluid goes out, teeming out. Got it. What is the outlet water temperature and the heat transferred to the water? Okay, um, we need the Reynolds number, of course. Is it laminar, is it turbulent? We need the Reynolds number, we need the properties. We need the properties, we need the temperature. So, for properties, T mean bar, equal, comes in at 25, I don't know what it's going to go out at. That's, that was asked for. I don't know what it's going to go out at. I got to guess something. I think, you know what, I'll make life easy. I'll guess 25 degrees C. No, 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 it's going to be heated. It's not going out at 25 degrees C. Say, okay, I'm going to guess it goes out of 50 degrees C. Okay, 
I can't argue. That's a fine guess. Go ahead and guess it. Most people will say, well, the purpose of that is to heat the fluid as hot as it can get. I'm going to guess it goes out at 90. And that's a good guess, too. I don't care what guess you make, but, you know, make a, quote, reasonable guess, 50, 75, 90. That's fine. So I guess 90, just to start. That's a starting point. So then properties of water, 57.5. But the tables in the back of the book are in Kelvin, 330.5, I just say 330. Go to the back of the book, get the properties. Okay, got it. Then get the Reynolds number. Reynolds number based on diameter, okay. So don't use velocity, I told you last time, we're using mass flow rate, 4m dot over pi d mu. D is four centimeters. Yeah. Back of the book, kinematic viscosity, 528 times 10 to the minus eight, I think that is. So Reynolds number based on diameter 121 times 10 to the fifth. It's way greater than the magic Reynolds number, 2,300. So yeah, it's turbulent flow. Got it. There he is right there. Turbulent flow. There it is. Use equation 860. Okay. Uh, is the fluid being heated? Of course it is. Fluid being heated, 0.4. So we go ahead and we use 0.4. Let's see if we can up there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> equation 860. Put everything in there and this gives H bar 7084. Okay, make sure that's right, 7064. Okay, so we've got that. Now, second thing, let's go upstairs with that H, and now we have to find T mean out, okay? In your notes from last time, here's the equation for T mean out. <clears throat> About T surface that should be. surface minus T surface minus T mean in times EXP exponential minus pi DL divided by M dot CP times H bar.
I know it all. I know TS. I know T mean in. I know pi, D, L, M dot, I know, C sub P, I know. I just found H bar, 7064. Put it all in there. So, T mean out. 47.5 degrees C. Got it. Now, uh, I got to find Q. Okay. Let's do the easy way first. Q equal M dot C sub P T mean out minus T mean in. I just found T mean out. Okay. That's the easy one. 188,000. One eighty eight kilowatts. Okay, so I found Q. All right, let's take a look at. Um, I need space, so I'm going to get rid of this stuff. Uh, if you don't want to do it that way, you can do the uh, log mean temperature difference. And let's make a plot of this guy. Let me see. Yeah, it's okay. This is constant tube surface temperature, and that's that. Tube surface temperature is 90, so 90 degrees here. The tube length is 4 meters. Comes in at 25. It goes out at 47.5. So that's how the uh, temperature looks as it goes through there. And then uh, we need, we'll, we'll put the area in. So Q equal H bar, surface area, delta T log mean. Where Delta T log mean equal delta T out minus delta T in divided by the natural log delta T out minus delta T in. Here's delta T in, 90 minus 25. Here's delta T out. 90 minus 47.5. The surface area of a tube, pi, d, l, circumference times length. Put that in there. If you do that, Q equal 188,000 watts. Of course, same answer. You can do it either by m dot c sub p t, or you can do it by the log, the log mean temperature difference. Generally, it's easier the m dot c sub p t. But sometimes that's not an option. For instance, what if the problem said, um, I'm going to put 188,000 uh, watts into that fluid. I want to do that. 
uh, so the temperature comes out to be blah, blah, blah. How long should the tube be? <laughs> Here's the question. How long should the tube be? Well, what do you do? Well, you get out your library of equations for tubes, and you try and find somewhere the symbol L. You hope you find L in the equation somewhere. Uh, let's see, where is L? Uh, oh, there it is right there. There it is. He goes up there, right there. Yeah, if I know Q, 188,000, and I can find T mean out, oh, I can solve for L. That's when you would use that equation as opposed to M dot C sub PT. There's no L in M dot C sub PT. Okay. Um, of course, these answers aren't right at all. They're not right. No, I, I know that. Why aren't they right? Oh, go, go way, way back to the first line that you started with. <laughs> For properties? Did it come out at 90? Oh, no, not even close. Not even close. Closer to 50, 47.5. Get a new temperature. It won't be that. Go to the back of the book. Get the properties at that temperature. Mu changes. Is it still turbulent? I hope so. Is C sub, does C sub P change? Yes. Is T mean out going to change? Of course. T mean out changes. Does Q change? Of course. Yeah, yeah. So you go through it another time. And now the temperature could up to be maybe 48.7. You say, oh, oh, oh. I'm within a degree almost there. But you know what? I'm going to try and get to within a half a degree. So you do it one more time. Get a new T mean out. Put the two T mean out here. Go through the whole procedure one more time. And now you get 47.8. And the last time was 47.7. Oh, I'm within one tenth degree C. I'm going to stop. Close enough. I'm done. So the point is you iterate until you converge at what you think is reasonable to converge to. But in the textbook, and in the class here, and on the midterms, and the final, you don't do that. You go through it one time. You make what you think is a reasonable guess for that temperature here. Um, and then you go through it one time and say, I would repeat the above. When you're all done right here, you say, I would repeat the above calculations with a new T mean for properties. But don't do any more work. But tell me what your next guess would be for an iterative procedure. Now, this is the easy problem. This is the turbulent problem. Uh, on Friday, we're going to work the much more difficult one, a laminar problem. Okay, so I think we'll stop for today. And so Friday, we'll work the one for laminar. A reminder, homework is due today before you leave. And then we'll see you on Friday.